So it's my opportunity to uh, introduce our speaker today, Randy Ruiz, to those of you in person as well as online. And uh, to introduce him, we would have to go back for me, back to when I was a youth pastor in Las Vegas. And he, he spoke to uh, a group of men there. Um, and we're still kind of figuring out if it's Las Vegas. I think it's Las Vegas, and not when I was just growing up in Washington State. And, uh, and it's some, it just stuck with me. The, the core of the message stuck with me, and it's been something that I've used all through my ministry years about praying for people, praying for healing. I always remember that. And then in March, before all of the COVID craziness began, uh, Randy was here in Indiana, and he spoke to uh, the men of Indiana. And so many of the men of our church were there, and we received powerful messages from, from Randy about honor and some other things that he, he, he did. And then, so we had a chance to touch base and connect. And, and the idea is, that, you know what, I want him not just to speak to the men of my church, I want to speak to to new life. And, and, and we've, this was even what we were going to have you speak on. If we remember, go back, Randy and I talked, we were, we were going to go a different direction. It was going to be part of our summer series. But then as God started stirring in my heart what was going on and telling me to dig deeper and to say, God, where do you want to take new life? And we started seeing about the church of a, that we, uh, a church that looks like heaven. And then it made sense that this is what we needed to do. And uh, I've been talking with Randy for the last couple of weeks, and we had dinner last night, and I'm telling you, uh, just buckle your seatbelt, just because I know that God has got a word for us, new life. God has got a word for us, new life. So just get ready, all right? So I want you to be ready. I want you just to sit back and get ready for what God has to say. So will you give Randy Ruiz a warm new life welcome as he comes? Come on. Amen. Thank you. So turn to the person next to you, smile and say, you are the best looking thing I've seen all day. Just tell them you are hot. You, you, you must be Puerto Rican. <laughs> now I do that because hopefully you're sitting next to your wife or your husband. And if you're not, hopefully you're sitting next to someone you wish was your wife or your husband. And if you're not and you're single, Pastor Dave and I will give you 30 seconds to stand up, scope it out, and go sit in a good spot. Ready? Just trying to help you out. Hey, <laughs> came across something I thought you might enjoy. Uh, Mr. Johnson, a 65-year-old widow man, multi-millionaire, wasn't feeling well, so he goes to the doctor. The doctor checks him out thoroughly and says, Mr. Johnson, on his way. Several weeks later, the same doctor sees Mr. Johnson at the country club, but now he has a 21-year-old blonde bombshell hanging all over him. The doctor says, wow, Mr. Johnson, you must be feeling a whole lot better. And, doc, and Mr. Johnson said, well, doc, I'm just trying to follow your orders. And the doctor said, well, what orders are they? Mr. Johnson says, well, doc, didn't you tell me to find a hot mama and be cheerful? The doctor said, no, I said, you have a heart murmur, be careful. <laughs> That's funny right there. <laughs> now, old Mr. Johnson went to the doctor and he heard what he wanted to hear. And so many times we come to the house of the Lord and the Holy Spirit, the great physician, will speak a word into your life. And if you're not careful, you only hear it the way you want to hear it. And I'm going to ask you to listen intently and to hear it exactly as the great physician has it for your heart. If you believe that, can you just shout amen? amen. I want to speak to you for a short time on the prayer and the healing for America. Prayer and the healing for America. Staying in Pastor David's series on Rolled Away, the power of prayer that rolls away fear and doubt and worry and anxiety, racial bias. And I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, starting verse 1 through 17. It is the story of Jehoshaphat and the armies that he was fighting and that he is facing. Join me now in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, starting verse 1 through 17. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meunites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. 
It is already in Hezazan Timar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard, and he said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations, power and might are in your hands, and no one can withstand you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity, have we not seen that, comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Our eyes, yes, Lord are upon you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones. I love that differentiate. On this Father's Day, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, a descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. By the way, Asaph was David's worship leader. Can you imagine being the worship leader to the psalmist of Israel? It's amazing. Verse 15, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Somebody shout amen to that. The Lord will be with you. Friends, in every arena of American life, God's laws are being openly and flagrantly violated. And it would follow that God's wrath will not be restrained. Yet, at the same time, God's word says, there is hope. There is a solution when God's people pray. And we must pray humbly, acknowledging the spiritual and moral bankruptcy of our nation. For three weeks, Daniel mourned and he fasted and he prayed and he cried out to God, and then the God of heaven visited Daniel. Daniel says, I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale. I was helpless. My face was towards the ground. Couldn't even pick up my head. Listen, friend, like Daniel, we must pray fervently, imploring God's cleansing and his mercy. Why? Because all our combined effort at time, wealth, and ability are not adequate enough to hold back the destruction of our nation. We are in a great spiritual battle, friend, between the very forces of heaven and the very forces of hell. And human weapons will not suffice. Only a mighty moving of God's Spirit will cause us as a church and a nation to look to Him and be saved. We must pray for this moving. You must pray for this moving. See, the history of ancient Israel and Judah is full of evidences that the prayers of God's people in times of crisis resulted in God's divine intervention. Now, in the text, the powerful Moabites and the Ammonites, we must pause there and interject that the Moabites and the Ammonites were descendants of Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. 
At one time, Lot was a man that walked with God. He was blessed because of God's covenant with Abraham. But there's a key point in Lot's life that he turns his attention to two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says he leaned his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And this was a single man living with the blessings of his uncle, goes to live in Sodom and Gomorrah. May I remind you that it was so it was so sinful in Sodom and Gomorrah that God decided he was going to destroy the city. So he sends two angels to get Lot out. Now Lot is married. He's married to a woman from Sodom and Gomorrah. We never hear of Lot being married prior to going there. So he's linked his life. He's linked his emotions. He's linked who he is to the world. And now the angels are trying to get him out. So much so that they walk across the city and they go to Lot's house. The Sodomites, who were sexually perverted, they want to have relations with the angels of God. And Lot is so wrapped up in his world, he's so wrapped up in the things of the world, that he literally offers his own daughters. Can you imagine those young ladies? And they're thinking, is dad really? going to give us over? Well, the Bible says that the angels lead them out, and just as the city is being destroyed, their mother looks back with fondness in her heart, and she turns to a pillar of salt. I've often wondered why God turns her to a pillar of salt, and then I realize that God looks at the heart of man. And so the Lord was going to give an illustrated sermon to all of eternity. I look at the heart of man. So when she turns to a pillar of salt, God is basically saying, I'm going to let you see on the outside what I've been looking at on the inside. Her heart was already hard towards God. And that night, one of the most disgusting and heinous things happened. And I love scripture that scripture holds nothing back. It tells us all the good and it tells us all the bad. And it says those two young ladies who were hurt so deeply, thought that all the people of the world were now dead. They got dad drunk, and dad got, he's grieving his family, grieving his wife. They had relations with dad. Nine months later, the first daughter gives birth, and she names the son Amnon, which means out of self. Out of self. Problem with America is we're operating out of self problem with many Christians were operating out of self. And the second is Moab, or Moab means out of self, and the second means Amnon. Amnon means to live by yourself. And some of the Meunites came to make war. So here you have the descendants of Abraham who used to walk with God are now coming against the church, or coming against the children of God, and you've got a major problem. Judah faced a potential extermination, and she's praying the dreadful consequences, or paying the dreadful consequences of her sins against the Lord. Yet when King Jehoshaphat heard of the coming attack, he inquires of the Lord, he proclaimed a fast, and the people of Judah came together from every town to seek the Lord. And King Jehoshaphat led all the men, all the women, all the children of Judah in an earnest prayer, prevailing against God to defend their inheritance. In just a little moment, I'm going to ask all the men to stand on Father's Day to help us pray and begin to lead the prayer for the healing of America. The healing of the nations, the healing of the races. Lord, let it start right here this morning that the presence of God would pour in this place. In fact, the men said, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us, and we don't know what to do. Here's the key line. But our eyes are upon you. I love the words of the old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Some of you who are younger than I have never heard it. It simply says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. My grandmother used to walk around the house and sing that, and 
and the presence of the Lord would hit her. She'd go, woo. Her little bun would come down, look like a slinky beside her head, just kind of bounce. And she would sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace we need this morning to turn our eyes on jesus those words still ring true today we too are facing insurmountable odds in our nation we're not facing the military might of a rogue nation in the natural sense. No, our war is in the spiritual realm and the forces and the armies of hell are coming with such destructive power. And unless you've been living under a rock, you know that fear, anxiety, and racism and prejudice, anger and bitterness are gripping at the heart of our nation. It's a vast army that's rising up The heinous murder of George Floyd has shocked and angered all of us. Thousands of people are protesting, and those protests have turned into rioting. People are asking the question, is the world coming to an end? Oh, my Facebook has been inundated by people saying, Pastor, are these the last days? I I mean, we've got... COVID, and we've got race wars, and we've got riots. Are these the last days? And I smile, and I write back, I don't know if these are the last days. In fact, the Bible says no man knows when the coming of the Son of Man shall be, not even the angels in heaven. So we don't know if these are the last days or not, but that's really not the question. The real question is, see, because we do know this. I don't know if these are the last days, but I do know they're your last days and mine and we won't be given any more days than the allotment that God has given us now so the real question is not are these the last days but what will you do with the days for God that you have what will you do for racial conciliation what will you do for peace and love and joy Listen, I'm a pastor, not a politician, so in times of uncertainty, I look to Jesus' words of comfort and guidance. He said, let not your heart be troubled or afraid. And Jesus knew that our fear would paralyze us and separate us and hinder our ability as Christians to respond to this last day's attack that is coming upon us with such ferocious amounts of power from hell. Let me also say, for the follower of Jesus Christ, there is no place for racial bigotry or racism or prejudice of any kind. And friends, there is no race that is superior to another race. We are all a part of the human race. And because we are part of the human race, we are all a part of a sinful race. And because we are a part of a sinful race, every single one of us need the grace of God. And the only color that we will see in heaven is the crimson blood of Jesus that covers every race, every sin, every creed that still flows from Mount Calvary. If you believe that, can you clap your hands and just thank the Lord for it? Yeah. Let me also say, God loves racists. Say, well, pastor, how can you say that? Because God loves sinners. God loves racists. God loves murderers. God loves rapists. God loves sinners. Thank God that he loves sinners. Because where would you and I be if not for the grace of God? He loves people. 
He loves people that can't seem to control their mouth. Have you ever met someone like that? They had no filter. Usually their family, family knows how to crank your tractor, don't they? Family knows how to tap dance on your last nerve. We were out to dinner one night, and there was a couple arguing in the, in, the, in the booth behind us. And I know I'm not supposed to be paying attention. I was listening to my wife, but I was also listening to them. And she was a little tiny black woman, cutest thing you've ever seen. He's a big old burly guy, and, and they're just going at it. Finally, she went like this, uh-uh, you tap dancing on my last nerve. And the whole conversation just stopped. I said, boy, I like that. And people know how to tap dance on your last nerve. Have you ever said something you wish you had never said? You wanted to push delete, but there's no delete button on your mouth? And it's easy to see how words can be used like a weapon. And we've all either been cut by the words of others or we have used words to, quote unquote, put somebody in their place. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 12, 18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Family, it's fairly obvious America needs healing. And always remember your words are like seeds. When you speak, you can plant words of life into others. You can reap a harvest of blessing in the life as others, as well as in your own. On this Father's Day, in just a moment, when you lift your hands and begin to thank God for the breath of life that he's given you, will you also say, Lord, would you help me to pour seeds of life into every race, every creed, every color, people who don't look like me or act like me, or talk like me, or smell like me. Because your words can bring healing to those around you. You never know how you can change a person's life by sharing a gracious word. Just a gracious word. Because God hears what we say every single day. He hears when you bless people. And he hears when you compliment them. He hears when you encourage them. And he also hears when you criticize them. He also hears when you stir trouble. He hears when you say with your mouth, have a good day. And when they walk away under your breath, you say, what an idiot. What an idiot. The prophet Isaiah says that we will eat the fruit of our words. So I hope your words are sweet. If you sow disrespect, sarcasm, discord, judgment, racism, you're going to reap sarcasm, disrespect, discord, judgment, and racism. But when you sow kindness, encouragement, and mercy, and peace, and love, that's what you'll reap as well. James 3, verses 5 through 6 says that our tongue is like a flame, and one spark can set a whole forest on fire. One spark or one word can start a major problem, but do you realize one word could also start a major blessing? One word can put people back on their feet. One word can breed new life into a young boy's dreams from the worst side of town. Don't be a part of the problem, be a part of the solution. May new life be known as the church that's a part of the solution. Be a lifter, be an encourager, be a healer. See, most of us understand that our words possess the power to build people up or tear them down. Yet too often, that truth is the most neglected area of our life. And what's amazing is, 
often we ignore the truth, most important area in our home. And I've seen people who treat complete strangers better than they treat their spouse. Better than they treat people in the church. It's vital that husbands and wives speak positively to each other, and especially important that parents speak positive words into the lives of their children, even more critical at this hour in the time of America when everything is stirring and people are so negative and you turn on one news station, they say one thing, and on the other news station, they say another, and those young lives are looking back at you. Understand that we all pray, God, give us faithful men. We all want godly men on Father's Day. We all want men that are loving and tender and careful and and love their families. But the reality is God does not give us men. He gives us boys. That we pour life into. You are not born a racist. You're born in sin, but it is a learned sinful act and so is grace and so is mercy and so is love so today lean on Jesus I say Lord new life wants to be a place that every color can feel at home several years ago I was on staff at a church in Los Angeles, California, Wilmington First Assembly of God in Los Angeles, California. And the pastor, David Godwin, came to me and he said, I want to start a bus ministry to South Central Los Angeles. And he told me the area he wanted to go to in our town. It was called Ghost Town. And the reason it's called Ghost Town is because the, uh, the average life expectancy is only about 18 years. And he said, I want you to go and hand out literature that you'll pick them up on a certain day and bring them to church. He was trying to break down the social divide, the racial divide. And I said, Pastor, for me to go there, you know, you got to have skin darker than mine. It's run by the gangs. He said, yeah, I know I'm lily white. That's why I'm sending you. Now, the board of our church, they wanted to go but they were too afraid to go. So they took our school bus, we only had one school bus, it was donated to us from Los Angeles Unified School District, and they took it to Earl Scheib to get repainted. Earl Scheib in Los Angeles is the kind of auto body shop, they'll paint any car for $99.95. That's Earl Scheib. Problem was, they didn't have the same color to paint the entire bus, and the board didn't want to spend more money so they said paint it whatever color you got it came out eight nine ten different colors it looked like the partridge family bus and somebody thought it would be cute to paint little clowns all over it with little red rose uh, but nose buds and and little flowers and balloons and it said first assemblies of god the happy bus And they pulled into the parking lot so proud. And I said, I looked at it and said, brother, you're going to get me killed in that thing. I announced to our church that I'd be, te- I'd be handing, uh, teaching on Saturday evangelism explosion and ways to reach the different ethnicities in our city. And on Sunday, everybody was, whoo, yeah, praise God. Problem was, they had a whole week to think about it, and no one came back that next week. We're talking about the healing of America. And Jehoshaphat saying, Lord, our eyes are on you. For several weeks, I announced this, and every Saturday after I announced it on Sunday, I'd go to church and no one would come. And I'd tell our pastor, Pastor, nobody wants to come. It's okay, you're still going. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. Then he would say, do you want to get paid? I'd say, yes, I do. He'd say, then you're going.
The day finally came when I had to go and hand out literature in the area so that they would know I'm coming the next day. Again, nobody showed up. And I'm scared to death. And just as I'm walking towards the bus, the only one there is Les Davis, the bus driver. In the parking lot pulls in a Volkswagen van. Out of it come four Samoan sisters, the Laulu sisters. I don't know if you've ever seen Samoan people, but they are large and in charge. And they had their little Ialaba Lava skirts on. They had their little lays on. They had ukuleles. They have very large feet. They're about that thick. And they came walking like this towards me. And they look at me and they said, little pastor. <laughs> Which is always very encouraging. We've been fasting and praying. We would have been here earlier. But God has finally released us. And instantly in my mind, I pictured Jehoshaphat and the young man standing saying, this is not your battle. They said, we will take care of you. So there I went with the four Laulu sisters to the roughest area of Los Angeles. I put one sister here, one sister here, one sister here, and one right here. And we went walking down the street, and there I stood right in the middle, the mighty man of God. I was not moving, and I was handing out the... The literature from under their arms <laughs> and the whole time they're singing we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord then they'd sing in Samoan and then a heavenly language to my amazement that next day as I stood on that bus I saw them coming the harvest was white it was ripe. And I saw every color, every nationality. They got on the bus, and I forgot to tell you that Brother Waterfield, the head of our board, uh, he, he wanted to go, so, but, he, but he was too afraid. So he cleaned the bus, you know, and he got all those little Christmas tree uh, air fresheners. And it smelled like pine salt, Lysol, the whole salt family. It was, it was all there. But when these people got on the bus... It didn't smell like pine saw anymore. No, it smelled like body odor and alcohol and tobacco. It smelled like a barnyard. And I'm standing on the bus, and the door was open, and I'm trying to lean out because I mean, it stunk. I said, Lord, it stinks in here. And the Holy Spirit whispered, yes. That's what you smelt like before you got saved. I said, not me, God. I grew up in church. And the Holy Spirit whispered, that's right. You smelt worse because you knew better. What do you smell like to a holy God? The last stop, the bus was packed and it's rocking. And the Samoans are leading, we bring the sacrifice. Nobody knew the song, but they were just, woo! And everybody's just rocking. I mean, there was Samoans on the bus, Hispanics, African-American. There was white. There was every Listen, God loves diversity. God loves salsa. If you don't believe God loves diversity, look at nature. In fact, if you don't believe that God loves, just look at the people around you. We all look different. And standing on the corner was a little boy. He had a beautiful afro. He had on Michael Jordan basketball shorts, a big long tank top. His shoes were untied. And he's the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. And we pulled up and he said, hey. I said, hey. He said, what's your name? I said, Pastor Randy, what's your name? He said, my name is Robbie. I'm telling you guys, cutest little guy you've ever seen. He looked right at me and he said, I got a question. I said, yes. He said, does Jesus love my daddy? And of course, the preacher in me, well, of course Jesus loves your daddy. He stopped and he picked up his, probably eight years old. He looked at me and goes, you better be sure. I said, I'm sure. 
Greg, can I go to church? And wouldn't you know the only place for that little boy to sit was on the front row as he straddled one, one Laulu sister, he straddled the other one, held on to the front rail, and he just bounced all the way to church. I had a lady in our church that was upset that I was bringing those people into our church. She headed up the women's ministry, you know. And I called her Sister Dumbbell. Well, I didn't call it to her face, but I said it in staff meetings. And, and, her husband, <laughs> and her husband was Brother Sounding Brass. He was the head usher, you know. And they were so proud that we had new carpet in our sanctuary. Bless God. But like Jehoshaphat, I realized there's a vast army that's dividing us, and we need healing. When I gave the altar call, I was speaking that day, and to my amazement, everyone on the bus stood and ran to the altar. Sitting in the balcony was Sister Dumbbell with her little bun, and remember when we used to have buns, and we were all in bondage? And she was sitting up there, and she had her shawl, and some of you will catch that later at lunch. And Robbie was his name, the little boy's name. He came walking down the aisle, and he knelt to my right, your left. We had these wooden benches for our altars back then, back in the day, and he started pounding that altar, and he started saying, Jesus, will you save my daddy? What a picture of Jehoshaphat and the people standing before the throne of God saying, Lord, our eyes are on you. Because if you come to me and say, Pastor, how are we going to bridge the racial divide? Pastor, how are we going div- to we gonna reach those people? I'm going to look back at you with a tear in my eye and say, I don't know, but our eyes are on God. And that little boy started crying out, Lord, would you save my daddy? I looked up in the balcony, and Sister Dumbbell stood up, and she started walking down, kind of like the stairs you have. You don't have to go to the lobby to come down. You can come all the way into the sanctuary. And I'm watching her, and I'm watching him. And i got to tell you, gang, in my heart, I thought, if that crazy old bird causes a problem, and she came all the way down. She knelt beside him. She put her arms around him and kissed him. And the presence of God, it's coming. It's coming. This church is poised for revival. It's coming. It's coming. I went to pick up Rob the next week. His arm is in a sling. His face was battered and beaten. He got on the bus, and I said, baby, how are you? And he said, pastor, I just need to know one thing. Does Jesus love my daddy? I said, yes. And he said, you better be sure. This didn't go on for two weeks or three weeks. It went on for month after month after month after month. I had a little boy on the bus that I nicknamed 411. I call him 411 because in Los Angeles, if you dial 411, it's information. And this kid had all the info. We'd go down the street on the bus. He'd say, hey, pastor, hey, tiny little guy. Hey, pastor, that's where all the hookers hang out. Hey, pastor, you see, the gangs run this street to this street, and the Crips run this one to this one. I mean, he had, that's where you can get your your weed. That's where you can buy your crank. And he knew where to buy all, probably seven, eight years old, and my heart was breaking. But on this day, he grabbed my jacket, and he says, pastor, do you want to know why Robbie's always beat up? I said, yeah. He said, well, his bedroom wall is our living room wall. And his dad beats him up every Saturday night because he goes to your church. And then he gets up on Sunday morning and prays, save my daddy. 
I, see, I can see Rob standing on the street. I can only imagine what Jehoshaphat felt like when he heard a vast army was coming against him because 411 grabbed my jacket and he said, Pastor, see that really big man? And this guy looked like the Incredible Hulk. And I could see him coming towards the bus. Did you know that the Bible teaches that the devil has the ability to create a train of thought that so fits your way of thinking, you suppose it comes to your own line of reasoning? And these, these thoughts will come. And if you dwell on the thought too long, they will create a stronghold. Oh, you're making me wish I had tonight to teach you on strongholds. Because if you're not careful, Satan will create a stronghold that you can't reach those people. You can't go across racial divides. You're only a small congregation. You can't do anymore. That's the lie from the pits of hell. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Possible. And so I saw this man coming, and the thought hit me. He's going to hurt you. So I told Les, the bus driver, I said, hey, bro, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put my arm through the rail coming up the stairs. You go about five miles an hour. I'm going to lean out the bus. I'm going to grab Rob and pull him in before he gets to the corner. And the whole bus was rocking. Woo! We bring the sacrifice. Woo! And they're just rocking. And I'm leaning out the bus door. And I'm just about to grab him. Now, Rob's arm is in a sling. I'm just about to grab him. And I get, he goes like this. And we go past him. And Les stops the bus. And I look at him and say, what are you doing? And he looks at me and says, just like this, as he puts his foot up to kick me in the rear, get out there, mighty man of God. (laughs) I thought, brother, you got the wrong Puerto Rican. Uh Uh-uh. And just then, Robbie comes walking up. He's out of breath. His dad is behind him. His dad is six foot 100. And he's. And Robbie looks at me and he says, Pastor, Pastor, I've been trying to get your attention. Does Jesus love my daddy? There's a vast army, Jehoshaphat, that's coming, America. I've been trying to get your attention. Does Jesus love my daddy? Let's face it, guys. I, I, I said yes before I knew what his dad was doing. And everything in me wanted to say, there's no way God loves your dad. He's going straight to hell. But something will rise up you, a revelation, so it seems, and it'll shoot right through your heart like a laser and a beam, and something suddenly will come out of your mouth. And I looked at him and said, son, if your dad was the only man left on earth, Jesus would have come and died for him. He said, well, can you go to church? And wouldn't you know it, the only place for him to sit was in the front row as the Laulu sisters sat behind him and around him, and they sang in his ear the whole way to church. We bring the sacrifice, pray. I was leading worship that day, and when I gave the altar call, all the people came forward again, and Rob went to his corner, Sister Dumbbell stood up and walked down with her husband, put her arms around her. And he began to pray, Jesus, save my daddy. His father was sitting in the the last to third row in the back. Rob got up and went and stood in the aisle, right against the back double doors. And he went like this. Hey! It was real quiet in there, like it's quiet in here. And I wanted to say, shh, this is the assemblies of God. But when you're facing a vast army, and your eyes are on him, He said, does Jesus love my daddy? I gave him a thumbs up. He walked to where his dad was sitting about the last couple rows, took a hard right, was kicking people's feet and knocking over purses and reached with his good hand, the other hand in a sling, and he started pulling. When's the last time you compelled someone to church? And he's pulling. 
I found out later in the lobby that he was saying, Daddy, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Let's get it while the getting's good. He came down, and I could see the man coming. So I got up all the way on, on the, as high as I could on the platform so I could look into his belly. And he looked at me and he said, Preacher, can Jesus love a man like me? And I said, Sir, you heard what I told your son. If you were the only man left on planet Earth, Jesus would have come and died for you. He looks at his hands and he says, Do you know I beat my son every Saturday night because he comes to your church? He says, I prostitute my, my wife out on Pacific Coast Highway. My sons are doing time in jail because they were carrying my drugs and they're too afraid of me. He said, can Jesus love a man like me? I said, yes, sir, he can. He looked at me with now tears. His lips are trembling. This large man is trying to hold it together. And he looks at me and he says something that changed my ministry forever. Listen, new life. He said this. If what you say is true, then I don't want the stained glass Jesus. I've tried that Jesus, and he's failed me. And he looked at his son, he said, I want what he has. Because I couldn't beat it out of him, I couldn't shake it out of him, I couldn't scare it out of him. Whatever it is he has, I need it, I want it, I've got to have it right now. And as I'm coming in this morning with the intern that picked me up, Chase, is that his name? And Chase and I are talking in the, back, in the car, and we pull down the street, and the Holy Spirit said, you tell that church that they are to be not a stained glass Jesus church, but let them show the love of Jesus to a lost and a dying world. Every color, every nationality, and every race. Well, we prayed with that man. He accepts Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he bent down to kneel next to his son. He put his arms around him, this time not to beat him, but to hug him and hold him. And listen, gang, for the next six months, every day, they would go to the corner of Pacific Coast Highway and Gaffey Street, where the wife would be a prostitute, and he would talk to her. And I'll never forget the day when the center doors opened. Here came Robbie with his mom in one hand, his dad in the other, and they came all the way down. Hey, they don't look like us. Oh, you can clap your hands for that. They don't act like us. They don't talk like us. But Jesus loves them. He loves them. And the, the question is, can we make a difference? You know, there are six million people in America that claim to be born again. I want all the musicians to come, and I want you to prepare to sing that song you sang, the last song you just sang. All the musicians, all the singers. And I know you're sitting there and you hear this kind of message and you say, Randy, can we make a difference? Listen, often God used the prayer of one man to cause a whole nation to return to right living. And Dwight Moody said, every substantial move of God's spirit can be traced its beginning back to one person praying. And we're about to go into a time of just crying out to God for America. Because we need a revival. We need it. The word revive, I was telling Sharon with Pastor, when you have that conversation like we just had with people, the word revive simply means to restore to its natural or original condition. Did you know that revival starts in your heart? And I want you to ask yourself the question, do I need to be restored to my original condition with God? I was watching Counting Cars. I was sharing with Pastor. It's a show out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, the owner has a very high-end automobile shop. And they go out looking for old Thunderbirds and old Corvettes. And he told all his guys in the shop, he said, hey, guys, we're going, to rest we're going to revive these cars. And my ears perked up. 
he said, we're going to go back to the manufacturer's original specifications. Like it rolled off the showroom floor. And I want you to get the original color paint and the original interior and all the original engine parts. But then he smiled and said, but we're going to give it upgrades. And the Holy Spirit, it's amazing how the Lord will teach you the most practical things to give you the most amazing truth. And the Holy Spirit said, Randy, you tell new life. It's time. They're, they're poised for revival. And God is bringing this church to its original condition on why he created you. To win the loss. And I'm sitting with Pastor. If you could play just softly for me, guys. I'm sitting with Pastor last night at, at B-Dubs, and we're sitting there talking. And I said, listen, I was praying, and the Lord told me that he's given, he's given, I hadn't even seen the church yet. And the Lord told me to tell your church that he's given you a warehouse to house the harvest. And he looked at me, and he said, what? You're sitting in a warehouse that God wants to fill with the harvest. And revival begins in you with you and begins with me. And just like Jehoshaphat, we have to say, Lord, our eyes are upon you. And the Lord is saying to this church that if you'll return to your original love for me, if you'll return for your hunger, if you'll allow me to break down every every wall of hindrance I will bring a spirit of revival that will cause every nation, every nationality to begin to flock to this you'll fill with the anointing of God how hungry are you to say Holy Spirit our eyes are on you we want to follow you wherever you may lead whatever you tell us Lord that's exactly where we want to go that's what we want to do Right now, there are even husbands and wives that you're about to get healing in your marriage when you lift your hands and begin to say, Lord, you lead us, we'll follow. The continued blessings of God to move in this place. Because we face problems so pervasive as to threaten our very survival as a free nation. And our greatest need is for spiritual awakening. But the world will not get an awakening if you don't first get a revival. How hungry are you for what Robbie had? How hungry are you for more of Jesus? I'm going to ask you at the count of three to stand to your feet, to throw your hands in the air and say, Lord, just like Jehoshaphat, we cannot face the armies that are coming against us, Lord. But our eyes are upon you. In fact, I want you to stand at the count of three and just put your hands in the air and just say, here I am, Lord. Are you ready? If you're hungry for an outpouring of God, if you're ready for God to use you in this end time revival, this is why this church was created and you're literally sitting on the threshold of an outpouring of the presence of God. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. At the count of three, if you're hungry for it, I want you to stand. One, don't miss it. Two, three, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now. Everything in me says it's time to pray. And I know I've gone over my time and you've been a very gracious, gracious congregation. Something's about to happen in this place that's about to birth one of the greatest moves of the Spirit. We're about to move into a time of intercession. And I want to invite our lead pastor back to explain to us how this is going to happen. Come on. So one thing we haven't done yet since we've opened up is open up the altars in the sense of coming forward. And we are opening up our altars. I know if you're online, you can't come right here, but you need to make an altar where you're at online. And we want to welcome you to come forward. And, and this, is the, this is the way that we're simply doing it, is that if you just want to come and seek God, but you're just not in that place to have someone touch you, if you know what I'm saying, put their hand on you or pray over you, I'm asking you to simply come and come down on your knees. 
If you come forward and come down on your knees, what that's saying to us is that you want to pray, you want to connect with God, but you don't want someone to touch you. You're just not in that safe zone. You know what I'm saying? We're all in just different places. And so, but if you do want someone to join with you in prayer, then you'll come forward and stay standing. All right? You'll stay standing. And then if someone wants, so if you feel led then to pray for them, remember we've talked about risk with purpose, right? Risk with purpose. So then if you feel led to come forward to pray for someone, you come up to that person and say, can I pray for you in the front or do you want me to pray from you from behind? It's that simple. And then you'll just pray over them. But we're just opening up the altar. We haven't done it yet, right? So this is our first time. We feel like this is the moment to open up the altar again, to open up this altar. We always believe the altar is wherever you're altered. So that means when online, you can respond because the altar, you're building your altar. But here we're saying, come on, let's make a move forward and saying, God, do what you want to do. Uh, Randy was talking about our original setting, and I, I uh, recently received an article from one of our uh, life, New Lifers from the Rescue Mission, and it was dated in October of 1984, and in it, Pastor Thompson, our founding pastor, says, the purpose that New Life was, was created was for souls to be saved and for, the, for them to dig into God's Word. And all I tell you, September 27th, when we relaunch once again, that's, where, that's the original setting we're going to. And so what we're saying today is, God, use me for souls to be saved. Help me to dig into your word. And just know this, the souls may not look like you. They may not think like you. They may not act like you. I believe there's a harvest coming to new life. I really believe it. It just doesn't look the way we thought it would look. It's going to be better than what we thought. And so what we simply want you to do is to take that opportunity to respond. Randy, I'm going to give this now back to you so that they know how to respond in the altar time. Thank you, Pastor. At the count of three, just so we move together. And to reiterate what our pastor has said, something supernatural happens when you step out in faith. Like Robbie did, it was a, it was a faith step. Just say, Lord, I'm coming and I'm going to pray for the healing of America and use me use me. So at the count of three, if you're longing for more, you're longing to be used, you're longing to have conversations with people but don't know how, and you need the energizing of the Holy Spirit, you need God to do miracles in your life, whatever it is, at the count of three, you come. And as our pastor so eloquently said, if you're standing, we'll pray with you. If you're not standing, then you and God are having some some deep conversations. One, don't miss it. When I count to three, you just come. Two, three, come right now. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Just come. Lead us in that song. Just come. Just come. Let's pray in a revival. Down on my knees.
surrender I surrender I want to know you more I want to know you more I surrender I surrender
them loudly. I've asked them to play softly so you can lift your voice loudly in prayer. And all over the room right now, just say, Lord, use me. That's it. For the next 30 seconds, Lord, use me. You've rolled, rolled, used me to roll back the fear. Use me to roll back the doubt. Use me to roll back the racial inequality. Lord, use me. Lord, use me. I want you to call out the name of your children and your grandchildren. Lord, for my sons Christian and Morgan and Quentin and Ashton. That's it, don't stop, don't stop. Lord, that we would compel people into the warehouse, Lord. If you're watching me by line, Father, I pray for those that are watching online for the healing power of God to begin to fill their room right now where they are. Lord, I pray for my aunt in Southern California at 80 some odd years old, Lord, that's struggling with the COVID. Lord, I pray healing into her body. My dad, who had a stroke a couple of weeks ago, Lord, I pray healing in his body. In the name of Jesus. That's it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Jesus is something else. Turn your eyes up on Jesus. Look for. to know you more. I want to know you. 
I sing that out, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you thing this is not a a normal thing on a Sunday morning for us here at New Life especially in the last three months but there's something about lingering in God's presence but can I tell you that revival doesn't happen because you linger in his presence on a Sunday morning revival happens because you linger in his presence on a Tuesday morning or a Wednesday afternoon, or a Thursday evening. It's, revival happens because you have been t- spending time alone with God on a daily basis, so that whenever and wherever you are, you get this little voice, it's called the Holy Spirit, that says, go and say this to this person. Go and do this for this person. That's where revival happens and sometimes it happens because your senior pastor tells you to get on a bus and go to a part of LA that you don't want to go and for some of us it's about going to a place where you don't want to go next week we're talking about Jonah went to a place he didn't want to go took three days in a whale to change his mind But even then, after he went, he had a poor attitude. And I'm going to pray that the spirit of Jonah is not on any of us. That you'd be a prophet like Jonah, but not have an attitude like Jonah. That you would go to places that are different than you, that are unlike you, unlike you and me. And we would go to those places, and we would go boldly to those places. Before I close, just want to make sure, Randy, if there's anything else on your heart and mind you want to share before I close, I'm going to close. Don't let this be the end of what God did here. Let it be the beginning of what God did here. And it starts with what you do with what God has given you today. God, I thank you, first of all, for Randy to come and speak your words for us. To know that we have been sitting in, I've called it an extra large t-shirt, with a, being a medium-sized body, an extra large t-shirt, but all along we've been sitting in a warehouse waiting for, for the time for the harvest to come and to fill it up. And we believe the time is now. So we ask you, God, to help us to see the harvest. It will not look like we think it will look like, but the harvest is coming. We have to work the harvest. It doesn't just show up. The workers have to go work the harvest. We have to go out into the harvest. 
Harvest isn't going to come into the building unless we work it. So I pray, God, you help us to work the harvest that is before us. Too many times we pray, God, revival, come into the building. So the harvest can come in the building, but we got to go out of the building. Work the harvest. and That's how the harvest comes in. So we pray we recognize that from you today. May we pray. Amen. Those of you online, thank you for joining us and being with us through this time. We will see you throughout the week. Everyone else will see you throughout the week as well. And we will finish up this series next Sunday. As I told you, we'll, we'll go through Jonah. So if you want to know what to read in preparation for next Sunday, the book of Jonah would probably be a pretty good book to read in preparation. All right? Great to have all of you here. If you were new, we want to make sure.